already announced that this is the last, but this is the power pack kind of things. I'm very imp uh, interesting topic, right? Of open banking. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, some of you might be intrigued. What is this open banking, right? I think when I was in DCP Bank, that was my last assignment uh, before I joined into the digital fifth. Uh, so set up the entire open banking, API banking. And I got fascinated, right? The power that APIs can create, right? And create that new business model. But I'm not here to, I'm primarily gonna ask the panelists and share their thoughts on this thing. So I'll start with Hidesh. Uh, uh, the ICSA has been one of the pioneers into the building the different business model around open APIs and fintech partnership, new business model creating, right? And uh, on behalf of him only, I'll tell that they also run that, uh, one of the largest uh, developer portal, uh, right? With the maximum number of APIs. So, Hitesh, if you can just walk us through the journey of open banking in India and how do you see that the open banking going to influence the next phase of the banking growth? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, why open banking, right? Let me start with that. So, let's say if you are a bank, I think uh, there are two ways you can grow your business. So one way is to kind of build, you know, organically, uh, develop your own channels, you know, or digital channels to market and distribute your products, right? That is one way. The other way is you partner with, uh, you know, uh, the others and uh, use their platforms and channels to market your products. So anybody who wants to grow, I think, has to adopt both these approaches, right? And, uh, that's, and, and that's how it, you know, led to the concept of whether we call it open banking or banking as service model. Uh, Essentially, uh, and, and, and if you want to partner, uh, you need to kind of, you know, ensure that if, if you want to offer your services and products digitally, you need to integrate uh, it with your, you know, integrate your platform, your product, your tech stack with the, you know, your, your partner. So, uh, and how well you integrate, how well you build your customer journeys, you know, also defines the success in terms of how, how how, how you are able to offer those products and services on third party platform. Uh, so, you know, uh, I think for us and then for I think industry also the journey started around, you know, uh, uh, in, in, a, in a big way, it was existent in some small, you know, uh, uh, tie ups and small, you know, partnerships, but in a big way it started, let's say around six, seven years back, uh, when we saw emergence of lot of third party platforms with huge customer base, right? So we saw e-com platforms like, you know, Amazon or Flipkart. Uh, we saw, you know, uh, the food delivery apps like, you know, Zomato or Swiggy. And they have large customer base which they are catering to. Now, if you want to offer, you know, the financial products or services through their platform to the end customer, uh, the only way you can do it is if you have, you know, one is to do host-to-host -host integrations and second way is to kind of, you know, build APIs, right? And that's where we, uh, you know, kind of felt that the partnerships would be way of life. And if partnerships are way of life, you know, you can't every time, you know, create customized kind of, uh, you know, integration uh, and then spend a lot of time in integrations. So the most difficult thing if you ask anybody in partnership is that commercials are not a problem. Uh, you know, willingness to work, to work together is not a problem, but tech integration is the major problem, right? And that's where I think the entire, you know, uh, open banking platform, you know, people who have invested in, you know, creating open banking platform are the ones who are able to easily partner, integrate and, you know, uh, go to the market in a much more efficient way. So we, we started building the API portal uh, much early, uh, which we call it developer portal and uh, uh, our, our endeavor was to, how do we make it an open innovation platform and what we mean by open innovation platform is that anybody who wants to consume our APIs can come onto the platform use it seamlessly without anybody's intervention. So, uh, and then we have created a lot of stuff, you know, uh, on the developer portal, whether it is uh, documentation, whether it is, you know, sample journeys, uh, you know, developer tools, you know. So it, it becomes really handy for uh, anybody who wants to integrate, uh, you know, with it. Uh, so my sense is that uh, we are uh, at a stage where a lot more things will evolve, a lot more product innovation is, is yet to happen, right? Uh, using, you know, uh, the, the uh, APIs, using the uh, open banking framework, there's a lot more innovation which, which, which still we have not seen. And then especially with the framework like account aggregation coming into play, I think it will, it will, it will only fuel the growth of the open banking framework. Yeah.
Thanks, sir. <coughs> it is. Uh, so I'm not going in a particular order. Uh, so Vivek, I'll come back, come to you. So I think uh, Yes Bank is also one of the very early startup on the using their open APIs, right? I think somewhere in 2013, 14, you can correct me. How, when did you feel that open APIs can be used as a lever for the growth, right? And uh, you created some of the use cases, but what are the features also that you see? So maybe just bit on the journey and then what are the features that you see us going forward? Right, uh, so I think for us, uh, 2013 was indeed the year when we first dabbled with APIs. And that was with, that was the time when we were dabbling with uh, APIs on a bespoke manner, with corporate integrations directly integrating with their ERPs and so on and so forth. Host to host kind of the method. Right? Um, but on an API front, we <coughs> instant gratification was what we were after. Uh, try and give that experience to the customer because one of the early learnings from uh, for us was first of all it was a strategic imperative right it was not uh, otherwise we didn't have a standing we were the youngest bank in the country at that point in time and if you want to compete in the cash management space and not have an innovative product you, there wasn't any standing at all so uh, one of the things which we wanted to do was try to disintermediate the disintermediate the whole host to host process there were some set standards which was already a decade old and stuff and prima donnas already uh, fully established among large customers. So the first thing which we went after was to create the infrastructure available required for it. Even before we fired our first API transaction, we had a full stack ESB in place, an enterprise service bus in place. We had it scaled for 10 times the kind of volumes which we in fact eventually had to upgrade much earlier than we anticipated. But even before the first transaction we were in, when there weren't any customers, we had scaled it for 10x the volumes that we were anticipating at that point in time. So when we were after instant gratification, and we started doing a couple of use cases, especially for marketplaces and the likes, and they started uh, realizing that, oh, uh, it's not just an accounts receivable, accounts payable kind of conversation now, it is a competitive differentiator. So for a marketplace, when we went and spoke to him, it was not the ops guy who was speaking to us. It was the head of strategy who was speaking to us. And he wanted to try and use our APIs to differentiate himself from the market. Hey, if everybody else is doing refunds in two days, can I, t can I do it in one hour? Right? So that was the kind of uh, change that APIs really brought about. So once we started dabbling with uh, uh, APIs, one of the earlier investments were also in microservices. And then putting it all together as a composite, depending on the use case of the, uh, of the corporate. Around 2016, 2015, 16 is when the first payment aggregators, neo banks, started coming up. <laughs> and for them, this composite APIs was uh, invaluable because uh, now we were not yet talking about having uh, access to individual banks but to try and pool it all and give them an experience they were handling the money themselves that came with a lot of new challenges from their side from our side thankfully we were also able to because of the experience we had gained by then anticipate some of the regulatory changes that could come through so we had already started putting the escrow structures in place we had already started uh, differentiating and segregating businesses and so on and so forth uh, high transaction processing speed was something which we did with lot of lot of use cases started emerging right uh, the penny drop which has become very ubiquitous now started coming about it was a novelty at that time for new banks to try and validate their customers and trying using an imps transaction for that now it's extremely passive but those times it was extremely innovative for them and to try and use these rails then we quickly realized that if we jumble that with the regular transaction one is going to be collateral for the other so we started having a separate service for that cross-border transactions came about, supply chain finance came about, receivables finance started. So when we started realizing that to some large corporates, instant gratification doesn't matter much to them. Reconciliation does. So we started addressing those problems, creating digital ledgers or virtual accounts or whatever the case may be, to try and provide that facility to the customer. So over a period of time, we, we realized that it's not just a technology product, right? So open banking, one of the misnomers is not, it's not a technology product. It's not about making it fully convenient, making it extremely available at very high speeds, 24 bar 7. It's also a banking product. So the, the, the proper juxtaposition of both of those concerns, I think, is where uh, we are right now. And there's a lot more to happen. Thanks, Vivek. So uh, now, Keshav, I come back to you. Uh, I think you are one of the youngest bank now, right? Uh, now you've been converted from cooperative bank to the small firm, but still I can treat as the youngest bank. Uh, how do you feel that open APIs becoming an, a kind of the lever for enabling the business to grow for you? Uh, how you are uh, emphasizing the role of the open API, creating that value, the business expansion for you or the helping the business to grow kind of thing? Right. Uh, so as you rightly said, we are 18 months old as a small finance bank. We've been operating as a cooperative and the first cooperative in India to get a small finance bank license. 
so for us, uh, uh, open banking has been uh, an extremely important part of the whole thing that we have set up in the last 18 months. Uh, so just to give you some examples, uh, we realized that, uh, you know, because of, uh, as my fellow panelists said, API was already very, very prominent when we started our journey. And we took the first leap of faith and two things we did. One is that we are the only one perhaps where core itself we have hosted on cloud. So understanding the scalability as a challenge, I think that was one decision. And second, for the first 18 months, all the things that we wanted to do ourselves, we wanted to do through an API only. So uh, from the very beginning, the first account we started opening was completely end-to-end -end digital journey. So 95% uh, of the account we still that we open is through our own internal API. So uh, for the first phase, it was important that we test these things out before we go to the market. Uh, and now we reached a stage where now these APIs are tested. I think one very interesting thing that, you know, I wanted to kind of highlight is that it's a very great leveler. The whole open banking as a concept, right? There are a lot of places, smaller banks, new banks, like we have uh, some disadvantage as well, right? Our brand recognition, perhaps a lot of you may not have heard of us, right? Because we are primarily in the UP, MP and those kind of uh, Hindi heartland. Uh, but when it comes to technology, right, it, it, it is basically once, for example, the IMPS API that he was talking about, it is no different from one to another. It's a question of either pricing or it's a question of giving better service. And I personally feel that uh, it's a journey, right? So when you look at the solutioning point of view, we started from host to host, we moved to API, now we're getting into embedded finance, right? And eventually it's all drag and drop. So what I feel is that for anyone to sell a financial product, it's not required that that entity needs to have a banking license or a financial license, right? So you can work with banks, you can create and co-create those products. Uh, for us, uh, in the last eight months, we have gone live with eight partners, uh, primarily on the lending and the payment space. And our experience have been quite uh, great, thanks to these gentlemen, I mean, they have been doing great job uh, of creating this whole ecosystem around it, right? I mean, 2013, 14, when, you know, when all these things started, People were not familiar with the concept like API. Today, everybody, the first question they ask, even in during this, you know, free time, do you have the API, right? I mean, that is given that you know API and how it works, right? So, the uh, the way we see it is that it's a great leveler. It democratizes the whole thing, right? And uh, as smaller bank, as a newer bank, uh, we do not have those constraints when it comes to open banking that you know how uh, how many distribution points that I have, right? The brick and mortar model. As long as we are compliant, as long as our licenses hold true, uh, and as long as we can support the partners, it's a great leveler. So I think for me, that's, that's very, very important uh, for a smaller bank to build it right, build it uh, uh, based on the learnings that, you, that everybody uh, has already created. One very important thing that I also wanted to kind of, uh, you know, highlight was this, uh, amid, uh, um, you know, amidst this whole glamour around open banking, I think regulatory compliance is something uh, is extremely, extremely impo important. And we have been seeing situations where there have been some adverse situation as well. Uh, uh, and, and it's very important for all of us uh, as an industry, the banks and all the partners who want to collaborate. I think there has been a lot of receptivity around understanding the regulation, you know, doing things, building things first, uh, and in a compliant manner. So I think that's, that's something that is uh, uh, extremely important. Uh, at Shivalik, we are building our developer stack as well. Uh, you know, uh, taking a lot of learning and cues from uh, the incumbents. Uh, and we're trying to create those journeys. So we have an advantage in the form of the last one to enter. So hopefully we'll learn and we'll continue to collaborate together. Thank you, Keshav, and I'm sure you will continue to grow. Uh, Sajish, coming to you, uh, I think DBS digital transformation is in a case study already in the industry, right? Uh, but how do you see that Open APS has contributed to that digital transformation, as well as how does you feel that Open APIs are helping the banks to do the innovation, maybe in partnership with the fintechs or maybe internally also. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Rishank, for uh, having me as a part of this panel. Uh, I think yourself, Samir, and the Digital Fifth team has done a fantastic job. Uh, the kind of topics that are being discussed, uh, really, really tremendous. Um, coming from D DBS Bank, uh, you know, we have uh, invested heavily on digital infrastructure. Uh, we were one of the first banks that came out with a mobile-only bank in India in 2016. Uh, so we are in 19 countries, and we are often quoted as one of the best digital bank in the world. Um, um, so the partnership agenda, working with small players, fintechs, and the large players, is a part of our DNA. 
uh, what we have seen work is work with partners who have uh, three conditions which are met, right? One is uh, partners that bring in large number of customer base that we can target. So we can acquire large customers who are engaged on the partners platform and we can acquire them at a low cost of acquisition. Second, um, if you look at um, our customers, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, hey, I want to go to the bank. I want to do banking. Essentially, they are leading their life and banking product or banks are essentially a means to reach that end. So if we are able to seamlessly embed our product or banking service in the platform where the customer really operates or customer is really engaged, that helps us to uh, get to the end, end goal very, very fast. Third is data. Uh, so if there is a platform or a partner that knows the customer much better. You know, some of these platforms, our customers are engaged on that platform much better than they are engaged on the banking app. So if the, if the partner knows about the customer very well, we can provide the right solution to the uh, customer at the right time, at the right pricing. So those three things we look at and we partner with all types of players who, who uh, manage that condition, who meet that condition. Uh, in our discussion so far, I think what was missing was the customer. Uh, so the customer needs, uh, if you look at all the discussions we've had over the last two days, there is a lot of fundamental change happening in banking and the kind of solution that fintechs are providing. And we are very privileged right now where leveraging all these changes, we can make a meaningful difference in the customer's life, right? Uh, for the customer to be able to get the banking services at a cost which is affordable, at a time when he really needs it, uh, at a place where he really wants it. I think that is what open banking has helped us to provide. Thank you, Sajid. Uh, Hitish, uh, coming to you uh, again. So when you're looking for a partnership, because you hit the FinTech also, so when you're looking for the partnership and exposing the APIs, right? What are the factors comes into the considerations uh, for the bank to take, build that new business model along with the partner? Yeah, so I think the most important part, uh, which I think I will allude to what Saji has also mentioned, right, that one of the important criteria is that whether this partner should be meaningful both from the bank's perspective and from the, you know, the partner's perspective, right? And uh, what is in it uh, for both the parties? Whether, you know, we are able to build large volumes and scale in this partnership, it's, it's one of the most uh, important considerations, right? Because when you enter into a partnership, you can't, uh, you know, uh, do many such partnerships with the similar kind of players, right? So uh, you need to be careful in terms of the time and the resources which you invest. You know, it, it actually results into a, a meaningful partnership. So that's one. Second. Uh, you know how uniquely uh, you are uh, uh, you are able to serve the customer you know through that partner uh, and uh, is there a, a, a huge differentiation right i mean in terms of the offering which which you are able to uh, you know kind of bring on the table uh, so for example uh, today if you want to you know offer a lending product to a customer you will end up asking you know balance sheet pnl and lot of you know income tax data and a lot of other stuff from the customer, right? However, let's say if there is a merchant associated to an e-com platform and an e-com platform is able to give you data about the inventory maintained by the merchant, uh, you know, data about sales, sales returns, you know, what is the track record over the last, you know, six months, 12 months, then that data can be proxy, you know, for the balance sheet and PNL. And you can actually do lending basis that data cash, which is cash flow based lending, right? So here you are actually able to cater to the customer, which you are not able to either to, right? And in a very different way. So, so how uniquely you are able to, you know, bundle your product and services, you know, for that customer. Uh, and third thing is, I think, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the resilience and the, you know, preparedness in terms of the technology. So, you know, uh, if bank is prepared, but your partner is not prepared, right? It doesn't work. So uh, I think both the parties should be equally prepared in terms of the tech capabilities. And that's where, you know, uh, the partnership will work. So sometimes, you know, you find very good, you know, player for, a, and you kind of spend a lot of time, you know, uh, uh, but most of the time you end up spending is in the tech integration, right? 
So commercials and all those things get quickly, you know, decided. But then when you are launching a product in tech integration, it takes humongous amount of time. So tech preparedness is also, you know, another important aspect. And obviously, normal hygiene checks, right? You know, reputation, credibility, data, data privacy, data sharing. I think you should be also conscious of the fact that, you know, there are regulations around data and more stringent regulations will, you know, uh, we will come in future and, you know, one needs to be very particular about what kind of data you are sharing, what kind of data you are using about the customer. So I think those are hygiene factors according to me. And uh, one should be careful about all this while you are, you know, doing partnership. And do you also uh, define the KPIs also to measure the success of this partnership uh, because uh, whether it's adding to the PNL or not? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, at the end of the day, everything has, a, has to add up to the PNL, right? I mean, uh, so innovation is not just for the sake of innovation, right? I mean, and Tom, Tom, and you keep Tom talking about it. So I think uh, uh, the way you measure is either, you know, uh, is it giving you incremental customer base, uh, uh, and then obviously incremental customer base in terms of, you know, the kind of uh, the, the, the revenue you build up with the partner. So uh, all the partnerships have predefined, you know, uh, KPIs. And at times it can be also, it may not be always revenue, right? I mean, it can be like, for example, uh, if I offer my customers ability to pay their EMI through, let's say, Google Pay, I mean, you know, it's an, uh, you know, it's a kind of one more convenient uh, way of paying your EMI, you know, th through some third party app, right? You may not use my channels to pay. You can use any of these channels where I have integrated and, you know, so, so KPIs would be different from, you know, different, different partnerships, but yeah, there are KPIs and they are kind of largely been thought through, you know, once you, it's very well thought through once you kind of, you know, enter into that partnership. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sitesh. Now, Keshav, you brought the very important point of the regulatory compliance in building that business model. So, uh, and extend to the security, the data privacy and all these things, and being a regulatory, regulated entity, everything points out to the banks only because yeah, banks are directly being audited by the RBIs and all these things. So how do you ensure that when you're building these open APIs, and how do you ensure that, that this regulatory compliance and data security, privacy, everything has been taken care of by the banks themselves, rather than relying heavily on the partners? Uh, that's a very good question. So, uh, so there are actually multiple layers in which this whole thing works, right? So uh, one is when we initial uh, give a sandbox access, right? That's the time we are being very liberal and these are typically around UAD environment, right? So there's no confidential data or real transaction takes place, right? So it mimics the whole process, but at the same time, it does not give access to my core, right? Then uh, as uh, the commercial discussions, the kind of uh, arrangement that we will have, right? There are arrangements uh, typically rotated around uh, uh, technology service provider agreements or uh, business correspondent agreements. And there is clear cut, uh, you know, guidelines that RBI has put in place in terms of the do's and don'ts that is allowed. So one of the important thing that we do at the time of onboarding a partner is to ensure that the understanding in letter and spirit that's been defined by the regulator is there or not, right? That's one of the key filtration criteria. Once that understanding is clear, I think solving the issues around the technology uh, where you host the whole, uh, you know, data and how you kind of encrypt the whole thing uh, is is an easy tech, tech solution. So for us, what we do is that we allow the uh, partners to play around this sandbox, make sure that they understand how the API behaves, what kind of KPIs that we are expected to monitor and measure. And once that is in place, we do, uh, we have our own checklist in terms of, you know, where the data is stored, data confidentiality. And, and I think most important part is the regulations are very dynamic in nature. What was true six months back is not true anymore. And a lot of these changes happens on the fly. So uh, on one hand, uh, ensuring that the existing business does not get impacted by these changes and at the same time not compromising on the dynamic nature of the regulatory changes that's happening. I think that's a twin challenge that each bank uh, is facing. Uh, but uh, to the credit of the regulator, they have been very, very clear and transparent in terms of what the expectations are. You know, I, mean, I mean, any guideline most of the time goes through a process of discussion. It's been published for public comment. We kind of give our inputs. Our inputs are taken, discussions, deliberations happens, and then it comes in the form of regulations. So we have an inkling in terms of what's coming three months from now. And I think accordingly, we start making those changes in our architecture level. So that is... Uh, 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 
an extremely important part of the whole thing. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to touch upon uh, was this whole thing around financial inclusion. I think we'll all have to agree that what we do for a metro or an urban customer may not necessarily hold true for a rural customer. I mean, we have been primarily uh, operating around uh, financial inclusion on the SME space in the rural market, right? Bulk of our customer comes from that belt. And uh, we have been kind of uh, seeing that while we say that the whole process is digital, but there's still some element of touch that is required, uh, some amount of vernacularization of the whole process is required. And some of the partners, while they have built the whole thing digital, they still have touch points especially when it comes to onboarding a customer, making sure that those terms and conditions, those rate of interest is explained to them in the language that they understand is very different. So I think even in open banking, I'll say that one is for what for India and another is for Bharat. Uh, while more or less from a tech perspective, they look and mimic, but, but there is a subtle difference. And uh, yeah, as, as banks, I think all of us are like, uh, have our own targets in terms of meeting the PSL targets and stuff like that. So I think what you build for India may not necessarily hold true in total for Bharat, but at a tech level, I think it's pretty much the same, but that human element of it, the touch that is required, uh, sometimes go beyond the digital uh, realm. Thanks, Shishank, uh, I want to come in on the, on the data piece, the secrecy and the ownership of the data. Uh, it's, a, it's a tricky one. Uh, one is the regulation and what, the, what, the, what is the interpretation of the regulation. Uh, my personal view is the data is really owned by the customer. Right? So awareness of the customer uh, on what data is being used by whom, uh, consent, very clear consent, uh, it's very clearly articulated in the guideline uh, from the RBI. All that needs to be followed, but it can become gray. When you are trying to enhance the customer's lives by understanding them much better, giving contextual solutions at the right time, you would be using certain information about them which they may not be aware of, right? In DBS, uh, we use a framework called Pure uh, before we use data about a customer, about a platform. Uh, P stands for perfect, purposeful, so we evaluate every data element that comes through uh, to see whether it is adding value to the customer, adding value to the stakeholders involved, that's for P. U stands for unsurprising. Would the client be surprised if they come to know that this data is being used or the way it is being used. Are responsible, are we being responsible as stakeholders of the customer? Uh, so is, is, that, uh, is that use passing through that prism? And E is explainable. Can we explain the usage of the data? So every data use, every data capture goes through this prism before we try and apply that for any principle. Thanks, I just for adding that. Uh, so uh, Vivek, I come to you. Uh, so I think you know, open banking has led to multiple you know, uh, innovative business models to evolve, like connected banking, then embedded finance, and then now neo banking in both the retail and the SMEs, right? And as well as now the specialist banking as a service platforms emerging in the market, right? Can you just guide us, audience, also? What are kind of the trends or the features that you see uh, of existing new these models which has come, and also what are kind of anticipation that you see that in terms of the business model innovations or anything that you want to throw light on? So fundamentally, fundamentally first, right, um, uh, globally, as far as open banking is concerned, there was first a guideline and then banks started uh, uh, implementing it and then the adoption curve. I think in India it's been the reverse right now, right? We, banks started putting it in first, experimenting, dabbling, and then slowly uh, guidelines are coming in. But even, if you, even now, if you, uh, if you see, there is no guideline or a standard for open banking, for banking APIs itself. Uh, similar like UK open banking is there, but India so, doesn't so have that. So, for instance, yeah. it is in the best interest of any fintech to give a multi-bank, you know, completely transparent uh, offering to their customers. Uh, their their strongest point is in being able to tell the customer that it doesn't matter to me which bank you belong to, I can serve you, no matter what the bank is. I so the underlying assumption is that they integrate with all these banks. Now, please understand that all of these banks have different formats, different standards of APIs as well. Now, uh, if you really want this to evolve, if you really want this to adopt, I think there has to be some kind of consensus. I think uh, all banks or practitioners are generally waiting for some regulator to come and do it. But I think one, the European experience is a good, 
benchmark, if so to be, the Berlin plan as they call it, right? Where banks came together and said, you know, the differentiation should not be in the standards of our APIs. The differentiation should be in the underlying product. The differentiation should be in the underlying service levels. So we, for these sort of transaction types, this is the standard. So you would see widespread adoption of ISO 20022 and others. That's at a fundamental level, but uh, that has happened. I think sooner than later, this should come through if you really want the flow of fintechs and that ecosystem to flourish. Because I truly believe that unless that disruptions happen, uh, the mainstream banking generally follows suit and you know makes up for that gap. Now then it is incumbent on the fintech to go to the next problem and dissolve it. So it's overall good for the ecosystem to do this and unless the banks come together and create that open standard, uh, it'll be that much more difficult. So I think it's about time we aid that. Uh, we have aided the start of this industry. The fintech industry wouldn't have gone to the levels they have in India at this pace if the banks didn't have the APIs ready. Banks had to come up with the APIs. They had to take that leap of faith in the absence of a guideline. All those who have dealt with banks know that how difficult it is to get a bank to convince them to do something which is not backed up by some regulation. This was a huge leap of faith. Banks are often accused to be of, you know, very myopic and uh, closed and uh, not very enterprising. But this is a prime example. It is on this that the bank, uh, fintechs have essentially, you know, gained. Uh, while I can come to use case and other things, the second thing about open banking is the need for sound authentication. Now, it essentially means that a bank is honoring the transaction of a customer who is not coming through his platform, as, uh, uh, as, was, as was just mentioned, right? So what it indicates is that the bank needs to figure out a mechanism to authenticate the transaction also, because ultimately you own that customer. Whether or not he holds an account with you is a different matter. If the transaction is going through your rails, he is your customer, as simple as that. You should be able to authenticate it. Of course, OAuth 2.0 is already here. There are already talks of uh, WhatsApp-based authentication. Uh, the industry will find and must immediately come up with some solution which, which strikes the right balance between convenience and security. Because this is paramount. Uh, if the Reserve Bank of India is concerned, if we were to ask what is the one single most concern of Reserve Bank of India, it is customer protection. So towards that, that is there. So there are now digital public utilities. That is an emerging trend now. So you already see how uh, one public utility is fawning into other uh, embedded products from the government's table itself. So if you if if were to take the Oaken framework, for instance, the, you already have GEM and GSC Sahai, which is already embedded the Oaken framework into their products, right? So if they can take that, uh, as long as nothing is falling on us. <laughs> so uh, you can see that the government is taking the lead and uh, you know measuring up to. They have set up a standard and the next product they bring is incumbent on the other. So that this one also grows along with the new offering. So I think that is also one of those things. One thing which is grossly underpenetrated in the open banking space is the trade finance area. And I'm not talking supply chain finance or cross-border remittances. There are solutions for that, as we saw in yesterday's panel. Core trade finance products, products which can rely on technologies like DLT, on the use of a network, on um, you know smart uses of uh, OCR, and so many such use cases are significantly underpenetrated. And when we talk MSME and SME banking and so on and so forth, uh, there is no one viable large-scale solution for MSMEs to tackle the trade finance problem. While the payments, are, as Hitesh was saying, right, there are too many fintechs of the same type emerging. And because of sheer volumes and the traction they see, the, there is over attention on that. I think that is one area which should be encouraged. Because banks, once again, are all constrained by the traditional thought of uh, there is no regulation to back this up. This is documentary, it needs to be done this way. So I think uh, that is one area ripe for disruption, and I think we must encourage it. So we'll see some of these things coming up significantly. And the early adopters for these would be the MSMEs. They are striving for something like this. I think it's a ripe area and I, people should grasp it. Thank you. No, thanks, Vivek. Uh, now come to the, again, the important pointer. So uh, I'll uh, continue the discussion. Meanwhile, then I'll come back to the questions from the audience, uh, right? Uh, so get your questions ready. So uh, I think important is also to build in the capability, right? Uh, because it's now it's very clear that open banking is a driver for the growth. But how do you build the capability? I think it's not only at the tech infra, it's just there, right? But it's across the team, uh, business unit, from the sales uh, to the product team to the compliance team, the risk. So, so it is maybe I'll come to you that how do you go about the building that capability and the consensus among the team uh, to drive this open banking? So I think uh, the first and foremost part is that, uh, you know, let me start with the developer portal, right? So one, 
when you start building your developer portal, right? What mindset you will, you know, carry? Who is the end user of this developer portal? So one needs to think that if you're partnering with somebody, the developer sitting with your partner is your consumer because the developer there will be using this developer portal, right? So you build a developer portal thinking that developer who would be using it in, in your mind. So the way to build is that you clearly define, you know, your APIs, the documentation around it. Give examples of sample journeys, what you can build using these APIs. Give some examples. Uh, include some dev tools, you know, on the portal itself. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and, 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 you know, when you are also uh, building the strategy, get, you know, uh, some of the marketing team also involved in terms of how do you market this, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, once you've created this, portal uh, and obviously you have to keep uh, introducing more and more APIs basis, more and more use cases. Uh, and then second part is about, you know, get that marketing team, right? So marketing APIs is also an important part. Uh, uh, you know, you only building it, it doesn't help, right? So can you give dashboards to your partner setting that, you know, giving them what is the downtime of your APIs, right? I mean, it gives them confidence that if I use APIs of a particular bank, you know, my downtime would be you know, let's say only uh, a particular percentage and that threshold I am willing to live with, right? So there's small, small things in how you market your, you know, uh, APIs as well. Uh, so to my mind, I think the, uh, the strategy should be one, you know, uh, build APIs where, you know, uh, use cases are, you know, large and plenty in number. Uh, second is create a team which will be solution oriented team right i mean you are when you are giving apis you are apis is not in isolation it is not going to work right you have to build solutions around your apis so if you have a team which is able to market it as a solution and not as an api i think that would be a very differentiated approach and third thing is i think you know uh, the uh, ability to kind of you know showcase some large partnerships you know uh, to the world at large that how it has worked and inspire a lot of the, you know, uh, uh, whether it is your own team or whether it is your partner. And in terms of capabilities, I would say that, uh, you know, sometimes uh, like we do physical exercise and we term ourselves as physically fit, right? So we have launched a campaign for, you know, uh, we, we, we kind of call it as digital fit, you know, I mean. So within the organization, we have something called how you make all employees digitally fit. Right, so that is very, very important where, you know, your employees who are going to talk to, you know, your partners, if they themselves don't understand digital or tech, you know, they'll not be able to kind of, you know, uh, uh, communicate uh, effectively. So I think being digitally fit is the, you know, mantra for all our employees and uh, we have been successfully doing it. Yeah. Thanks, Satish. I think it's a wide open question. So anybody, uh, Sajish or... Yeah, uh, yeah. So if, if I understood you correctly, you're saying... Uh, when you're working with partners and when you are pushing the boundaries, there are too many different stakeholders that you need to bring together. And how do how do we manage that? Uh, that's that's a question. So uh, what what we have seen work in uh, DBS is a couple of things. One, uh, when we are really customer obsessed and we are trying to come out with uh, solutions which have not been thought about, and I'm not just talk talking about India. Just wait. I think it takes. Uh Audible? Yeah. So the sector which is ripe for disruption not yet touched, trade finance. Uh, there was this initiative where 17 banks had come together, IBVIC and uh, so you were leading it from ICICI side, I know that and many others. But somewhere that also is not picking up the pace uh, where uh, the first use case that we had identified which was LC. Um, I mean, uh, how can we fast track those kind of, uh, you know, the collaboration between the banks? to pick up one use case after the other. Oh, thanks for bringing this up, yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, anything which you build as a public infra, right, I mean, uh, it takes its own course and time to kind of, uh, you know, uh, get uh, percolated and, you know, uh, starts picking up, right? So, I joined bank uh, in uh, 2002 
and I used to be a credit manager underwriting mortgage loans. We used to underwrite, uh, but there was no Sybil, okay? And when uh, bureau started, you know, data started coming in 2006-7, and we are still as a credit manager not using it, right? We started using it much, much later. So uh, anything which is like, in, even if can I take example of NPC also, in its early days, if you see, right, I mean, uh, uh, all it started with a lot of government, you know, support, uh, you know, giving them certain platforms to be operated uh, from NPC itself. So any public infra which gets created, you know, has its own journey. Uh, trade finance as a, you know, uh, uh, problem to be solved, it's a large problem. It's a very, very complex problem, right? If you, today, if you see, trade finance is highly paper intensive. It is very cumbersome. It is too much prone to frauds, right? If you want to build around and, you know, uh, uh, to, if you want to actually build a system to solve the trade finance, it's not just about the banks coming together. It's building an ecosystem around it, right? And when you talk about ecosystem, to consumer to trade transaction, there are multiple parties involved. There is a buyer, there is a seller, buyer's bank, seller's bank. You have insurance company, you have freight forwarder, you have shipping agencies. So all this, you know, when they come together, a trade, fin a trade transaction it, it gets consummated, right? So to bring many more stakeholders together and solve this complex problem and give a superlative experience to the customer, I think a lot of fundamental changes are required. And those fundamental changes are one, at the bank level where a lot of this infra. So for most of the people, trade finance in new format means digitizing the trade for trade finance, right? Converting paper into, you know, uh, electronic form. It's not that. It's about reimagining the entire, you know, uh, trade finance wherein how do you reimagine the journeys there are so many documents which are involved in trade finance. Do you actually need them? You know, nobody has challenged them because since last so many years, we have been asking those documents. We are comfortable asking those documents. But nobody has challenged it, right? Do we actually need those documents? Do we need, uh, you know, uh, I mean, and in two banks also, there are, you know, roles which banks perform in a trade finance. There are many roles which are not required. If we build an ecosystem, you know, uh, the way we are envisaged. So to my mind, I think, it's a journey uh, which will take uh, some more time. But the way we see it evolving, uh, being, you know, looking at it uh, uh, day in and day out, uh, I think it's, it's progressing in the right direction. There are commercial, uh, you know, production is just uh, a few months away. Uh, you know, testing, piloting has been done. And it would be a revolution in itself. And apart from that, you know, we see many more use cases which are emerging, right? So, for example, today, if you, uh, you know, uh, if you see, you know, CBDC, right, I mean, uh, the pilot which has been kind of being run by, you know, regulator along with few banks, right, I mean, some of these initiatives, you know, IBBIC might take up, you know, in the, in the near future. And there are a lot many other use cases, like, you know, to use DLT, there can be, uh, you know, uh, treasury operations is a big use case. You know, we've been debating syndicated loans is another use case. So there are a multitude of, you know, opportunities and uh, use cases which one can think of, uh, which can be, you know, uh, solved using the IBBIC platform. Yeah. Thanks, sir. I think I hit this discuss discussion to end, and I, we, didn't, we didn't realize that 40 minutes has just passed away uh, because such an interesting topic and to discuss with all the panelists, uh, but we have to come to end. Uh, so uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks, thank panelists, you. for sharing your thoughts, and definitely open banking is a fever for the gro uh, future growth of the banking. Thanks, thanks, everyone. <laughs>